morning, ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues and listeners and anybody new to the podcast series. Well, my goodness me, we've got a great treat today. We've got a gentleman who I would say very few people I would be happy just to say nothing and listen to, but this is definitely one man, David Van Miller. Now, David is the president of the Falcon Group, which is a consultancy um, organization based in California. And also, I'm pleased to say, Ireland, and we'll come to that later. And also, he's the author of a, an aptly named book called Turbulence. David, it's an absolute honor to have you on the show, sir. Well, very kind very of you to have me, Chris, and thank you for that kind introduction. That's an absolute pleasure. Now, just before, just before we get into the show, a couple of, well, I would say unusual coincidences. A, you're in lockdown in Ireland. And that's where all my family come from. B, you're in a little place called Malahide, which I know very well, including the rugby club. And C, you're a, you're a frequent visitor at the Gibneys, which is one of the best pubs, I think, in, in that part of Ireland. And uh, especially a family called the Hazleys, who frequent there more often than they probably should do. So absolutely fantastic. And, and I we opened it up like yesterday, yesterday, Chris. We opened it up yesterday when it, when it was uh, allowed to have you know, social distancing, and we were there having our Guinness last evening. My goodness, and, I, and it, I, well, it's just the taste of it. It's God's own drink. <laughs> yes, it is. and it's not the same in a can. No, no, my God, my God, not at all. Right, now, where to begin with you? Now, you've, you've, you've had an incredible history, and, and obviously the book, Turbulence, has been uh, given great praise indeed from uh, the likes of Fred Smith, chairman of FedEx, uh, and many others, and you also have some colourful personality references in there. Just please, I mean, I could rattle off the airlines, Aloha, Sun Country, Pan Am, Golden Myanmar, Air Lyon, and then you've done so many others. Just give us a quick, if you can, uh, background of all of the airlines that you've been associated with. Well, I started out of college, uh, and I had a pretty good academic background, and I had different choices, and I chose TWA, and I went to Villanova undergrad outside Philadelphia. My objective was to see the world and, and get out of uh, my local town that I'd been raised, and uh, TWA came knocking. Uh, they interviewed thousands of people. They picked 10, and they were assigned us different cities. I was O'Hare for two years as a management trainee, so I sold tickets, gate agent, loaded bags, air freight in the midnight shift, all the airport jobs I did firsthand. And then fortunately, I was able to take that experience and move forward to be CEO of multiple airlines. And in between, I had finance, marketing, public offerings, union negotiations, airport construction, everything that you could imagine, I wanted to have some experience in. And I kid people that they moved me up from ticket agent because I wasn't a very good ticket agent. I probably wasn't. But in the meantime, all those experiences relate back to what I'll touch on later. And one of the reasons I wrote the book was because of the myths of aviation. One of the toughest jobs today is the yeah, gate yeah. agent. People don't talk yeah, about yeah. the gate agent. That's a tough job. So yeah. I spent 12 years with TWA and then recruited to Newport Beach to, to be at AirCal to run stations. And I did finance and marketing and ended up with the IPO and became president. We negotiated with American Airlines to buy us. They did. I ran Europe, Mexico, and Japan for Crandall at American for a couple of years. Uh, I went on to run ultimately Pan Am when it was owned by uh, Mickey Aronson of Carnival Cruise Lines and those folks. That was my first serious airline that was in trouble. And I was the CEO and I had to ultimately take it through bankruptcy and uh, brought it out the other side, sold it to the Tim Mellon Bank family. And, uh, and I left because I was it going to be involved with a family-owned business where I couldn't be on the board? And then I ended up running Sun Country right through 9-11. And that has a whole list of stories and experiences about that. We had the first airplane coming back into Minneapolis afterwards. Yeah. And, uh, and that was an experience. And then uh, I went down and ran Air Jamaica for a couple of years, owned by Butch Stewart of Sandals and Beaches. When I was on the beach, I was called by a recruiter, one of the largest in the industry, he said, how would you like to come to Hawaii? I'm on the beach on a Saturday having champagne in Montego Bay at Half Moon. And I said, that sounds interesting. So I went there for four years and they didn't have any cash when I arrived. So I had to put it through bankruptcy and get rid of vice presidents, renegotiate with unions and everything that 
they need to do today in the industry, including like Aer Lingus and work rule changes. All of that I lived through. And there's a lot of advice I'd love to give to folks that are making those decisions because it's more than just payroll and headcount, it's productivity. I sold that through bankruptcy, uh, ended up going back to Jamaica for a couple of years, Dallas, did some consulting, spent more time in Ireland because my wife had great friends here and had a place for 12 years. And uh, that's where I am now. I got a quick call to run down to Burma from a pilot to help them with Golden Myanmar, which was really a mess. Uh, And here I am now, and I decided to write a book about a year and a half ago about the myths of aviation, a bunch of stories, real life, hands-on experiences that you, 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 what I write about, people go to the movies to see. And it just was my life and uh, put it out in March and feel pretty good about it. And I also talk about leadership skills because when you're the CEO managing all these multiple airplanes and, and, and people in diverse locations and so on, usually in financial trouble, you learn leadership skills or you're not there any longer. Yeah, yeah. Well, you you seem to be like the Red Adair of Chapter 11 uh, Airlines. I'm afraid so. I've done three as CEO. But an experienced crisis manager as well and turnaround expert. So what you're seeing today, you know, you, it, it, must be, it must be something that you're thinking to yourself you'd love to get your hands on, huh? Oh, I, I jump in for free anywhere, anytime. It's, it's exciting. It sounds perverse. But when you manage bomb threats and bombs going off, earlier in my career where you had to push a button and evacuate a terminal because the, next, the terminal next to you just blew up. I mean, you, you get to a point, it's hard to explain, where you're very calm because you get into this zone yeah. where you, your brain goes fast and your mouth goes slow, which is always a good idea. And in the process, I've fallen into multiple challenging jobs. Norm Minetta, who was Secretary of Transportation under uh, Bush, indicated to me once over lunch in Washington, Dave, why do you take all these really, really hard jobs? And I said, I don't know. They keep calling. Because once you do one, they call about the next one. And it's, I guess it's a skill set. It's, it's not easy. But if you follow a, a certain set of principles, some of which you see in the book, if you follow those principles, you can get through it. Yeah. And also to be in positions of pressure, pressure is a privilege. It, it is. And you learn by, <clears throat> not the university, you have to learn by getting yeah, yeah. hands dirty. And I give an example of how you conduct yourself in court when you're in the box and you're being grilled by attorneys for the pilots union, which happened to be at Aloha. And we had proposals on the table and the pilot attorney said, Mr. Bamler, we don't think you should take plan X. You should take this other plan from this other investor because he's giving greater benefits to the pilots and others. And I looked at the judge and I said, your honor, I don't think I have to answer that because that's not in our venue and purview for this hearing in this structure. And the judge looks at everybody and says, Mr. Bandler's right. Are there any more questions? Now, how was I able to do that? Three reasons. The first one is when you're in the box or in any situation, you know more than the person asking the questions. The second is you don't have to answer the question like a politician. And the third one, probably the most important is you really are an actor on stage. Because if you get that mentality, nervousness disappears and you follow your judgment and your intellect and your common sense to manage yourself through the process. And those three elements really helped me through the day. It's, I, I, could, I mean, I, I, think that, I think that's great and it's a great way of doing it. And, and something that I was saying to you um, just before we came on, that common sense reference, sometimes you look at people and you think, my goodness me, where, you know, where, where have you come from? Because it's not common. And it's, some, of, some of the things that people do, and you said, about, um, you said about being an actor, some of the people that I've experienced when things go wrong, just like actors on stage, actors in a film, you get some great ones. My God, you get some bad ones. Yeah, you do. Sometimes uh, acting skills mask incompetence. Yeah. And uh, another example is the most powerful word I've ever used is why. Every time I Oh, yes, indeed. What helps you? Nobody ever gets it when I say what's the most important word. And and a a quick example is I'm in the cockpit, Air Jamaica, Philadelphia to Kingston. It's uh, 7.30 departure. It's quarter after seven in the morning for 25 years, 
same 7.30 departure. And I said to the captain, we're loaded, let's go, because I was hired to fix on type performance, which was the worst in North America, yeah. 10%. And I got it to the best in, in six months, and I kept asking why. So the captain says, we have a rule. We can't push back until departure time. I said, where's the rule book? He said, it's in, in dispatch in Kingston. Naturally, I go to dispatch, walk in and say, who's got the rule book? And they looked at me like, we don't have no idea what you're talking about. I said, well, there's this rule that you can't leave until departure. They said, there's no such rule. So I said, okay, tell everybody you can leave up to 15 minutes before departure. And we did. And a month later, I'm in the cockpit in LA flying to Kingston. And it's 20 minutes before departure. And I said to the captain, hey, everybody's buttoned up. Let's go. He said, well, no, we got this new rule only 15 minutes before departure. And it was my rule. Where's common sense? You yeah, see, yeah, yeah. instead of a statement and a page and a sentence in a manual, yeah. try common sense. Yeah, yeah, 100% agree with you. And that word why is so important because far too often people are told what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it, but they're never told why. And if you tell people why, then they start to understand. If you're in a debate with somebody, it doesn't even have to be a debate, family, friends, politicians, business people, and they come up with something, you say, why? And there's going to be a pause because they got to think, well, all right, let me think here. Why? And very often they can't come up with the real reason. And I found that in the different airlines that I went into, one of the greatest thrills is to walk into a new job as CEO uh, and reorganize and, and take charge and do stuff right away. It is, it is absolutely a wonderful feeling for me, not everybody, but for me, when I went into Aloha, we had, you know, 4,000 employees. We we're flying to a lot of cities and uh, the West coast and Hawaii. And we didn't have any money left in, in the bank and I had to put it in a bankruptcy. But the first thing I did first day met with the banks, met with the unions and developed a plan to save money because we were going to be shut down by the government. If we didn't pay back the nine 11 loan a month later, and we had to take action. I got rid of half the vice presidents the first week because you can't go to unions and ask for their help unless you've cleaned house at the top, which yeah. is, by the way, something that I would recommend to every airline on the bubble today. Yep. You must initially look at your organizational structure and your senior management because I can guarantee you when you added positions on the growth up, you don't need those positions on the, on the reversal of that growth. And that's where we are. Yep. Yeah, no, that's 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 very wise. So not only not only my reference to Reddit there, but you've also been termed as the airline doctor. Yes, I got that after uh, bringing Aloha out of bankruptcy. I think it was 1986 with uh, one of the industry magazines, and he interviewed me, and he came up with that moniker that has kind of hung around uh, to this day because nobody's taken as CEO three airlines through bankruptcy, much less started as a ticket agent and done every job in between. I've managed operations in 73 cities in 30 plus countries around the world. So I've got international experience. I'm not just a US centric executive. I've been everywhere from Burma to Japan, South America, uh, Europe for American Airlines. I was the point person with the, the Lockerbie tragedy because I was running Europe for America and we had the best security. So everybody ended up coming to us literally that day and the next day. Uh, as to how we were going to solve the problems that the UK government imposed immediately. Like you couldn't check your bags, you had to empty out everything. It was just, you couldn't run an airline doing that out of the UK, and yeah. particularly Heathrow. Yeah, but take, and it's funny you're saying that, I mean, sorry sorry to cut you off there, but, but um, what you're saying there, and you know, you look back at some of the other terrible events that the industry has experienced, like the oil crisis in 78, 9-11, you've just mentioned, 2008, you know, when everybody thought we were going over the, over the edge, you know, SARS and all sorts. But what you're, what you're saying there and, and the situation we're in now, you know, it's so important that, that people do things in a, in a, a slightly slower but more organised fashion and a consistent fashion because so many people are doing so many different things now. It's making the consumer panic a little and lose confidence and not be sure whether they should travel or do whatever they need to do. It's, it's just such a shame. And, th and that's what I don't understand. Well, I, I offer one word, uh, measured. Take a measured and then common sense approach to anything. I just read this morning an article that indicated when uh, President Trump had announced, I think the first time was maybe somewhere in 
in March that, uh, by the way, uh, you can't travel any longer in and out of the U.S. And a couple were getting on an airplane at JFK to go to Dublin that night. And they saw it on TV just before in the terminal. What do we do? Do we get on the airplane or don't we get on the airplane? That's still around today. This yeah. discussion about air corridors yeah. out of the UK and Ireland and political inferences here and there, because it's, it's a lot of it's political, Chris, you know, it's yeah, yeah. sort yeah. of yin and yang and, and so on that. What are we really going to do? One of the points I wanted to make to anybody that's willing to listen is the airline industry is insanely complex. Yeah. We make it look good in front of the curtain because we want you to buy a cheap ticket, get it easily, get there alive with your bag and pay as little as possible. I mean, that's the object behind the scenes scheduling alone between all the different requirements for maintenance, crew scheduling, marketing requirements, connections, uh, landing fees. It, it, the list is, is so long. And yet somebody, some bureaucrat somewhere in the UK or Ireland or perhaps even in the US is going to look at some numbers and say, okay, ban for two weeks. Now you've already put it in the schedule. People are getting ready to go to London or getting ready to go to New York or elsewhere. And oh, by the way, that trip is canceled. You're packing your bags and now it's canceled. Well, when, when do I go? You can't run an airline that normally schedules out 330 days and change the schedule. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nuts, but nobody, Chris, that is in power and decision-making arena understands it or even asks. Yeah, and I think, well, I mean, especially the, 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 the part of the industry that, that I've grown up in cargo, a lot more people are giving it a lot more respect and a lot more understanding and appreciation than ever they did before. But the complexity, like you said, you know, is, is something, David, that, that people don't really don't appreciate. And sometimes if you have, if you have predetermined actions and then people know that if a trigger is hit, you have to kick those predetermined actions into place, there should be a period of time which allows for, for, you know, for some common sense and logic and stability so that you don't disrupt so many people and so many organizations and businesses. Well, I'm familiar, I'm familiar with your cargo background. I researched you a bit. Uh, one of my first jobs was lo loading freighters at O'Hare in snowstorms and minus 10 degree weather, working the docks uh, with, with air freight. And throughout my career, mostly air freight was unappreciated. Yep, it, it yep. Just, they, they don't realize that there's a lot of cargo in the belly that's helping to augment the cost of the, of the flight. And uh, a quick story about Lockerbie, uh, because I was in charge, I developed uh, protocols and plans on processing through security. And Bob Crandall, the chairman of American at the time, asked me to make a presentation to their board of directors. And as I walked in for the presentation, he whispered in my ear, don't forget, Chris Fisher, who is on our board, lost his son on 9-11. Ooh. And then I started my presentation. Who was the guy to ask the first question? Chris, Chris. because his son tragically died in that incident. And uh, his first question was, what are you doing about cargo? And what are you doing about mail? Not about yeah. bags, not about passengers. How do you control mail? Well, as you know, nobody knows for sure what flight the mail is going to go on. I mean, yeah. cargo maybe, but certainly not mail. And there's security protocols for, for cargo as well. But it is certainly... Until right now, and you make a very good point, until right now, it was underappreciated, but now it's, it's doing a lot in the cargo world, even putting cargo up on passenger seats because of the nature of today's Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. But what, the point you're mentioning there about, um, you know, what about mail? I mean, still, still now, mail and, and e-commerce, you know, to a degree, needs a little bit more of a tightening up. Um, when you consider what, what you have to do with general cargo, you know, and uh, that's something that needs to be looked at. But that's a different, that's a different kettle of fish than what we're talking about today. But you're, you're talking about freighters. Now, I, I, I actually did my um, weight and balance checkouts in, in Shannon oh and Charger. God. And um, I think from this industry, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure the, the jobs that you've experienced have been fantastic. But I, I would say one of the most rewarding jobs in the industry is when you trim a 747 and you watch it take off. And, you know, it's, been, it's, it's, it's as near to a, a perfect trim as possible. It's one of the nicest things in the world. 760,000 pounds 
MIGTO, right? Maximum gross takeoff weight. You remember that? Yeah, but it's, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, but the whole, the whole world just opens up differently when you, you know, when you go on those training courses. I was working for Lufthansa at the time and, and um, I think we did, we did four weeks and three weeks and the testing was so rigorous, you know, it was, they were so, so, so focused on training. Great company, great well, background, yeah. but Shannon, yeah. Shannon at the time was also huge for all of the, oh, the yeah. operators, you know, and the stop-offs. You'd appreciate this story. The only letter I ever got in my file was I was a load control agent at O'Hare early in my career. Yeah. With the old 707s, and they had different operating weights. So I do my weight and balance. You know the drill. It wasn't automated. You had the green sheet. You yeah. Got yeah. The center of gravity. People tell you where to put the bags and passengers and stuff. And off I went. The captain comes in, says, "Who worked 770 last week?" I say, "Hey, I, let me check. It was me." And he said, "Son, you almost killed us." I said, "Sir," he said, "You used the wrong operating weight. I was off by 25,000 pounds. Now Ooh. that's a pretty big number for a 707." Uh, and you know, that was my, my mistake. I learned early. And then when I was at Air Jamaica, the weight and balance people had said the flight from Miami to Montego Bay to Kingston, when you get into Mo Bay, a lot of people are going to get off. So you have to move the people towards the front to keep a different CG, right? As you know, well, they didn't do it. The flight attendant, the gate agent, everybody in between dropped the ball. So it takes off out of Kingston and rotates and it's tail heavy. You get a tail skid. 10 feet damage to the tail, almost crashed. And the lady that was co-pilot at the time saved the airline. But when, he, when she pulled it down, it bounced up and down. And I interviewed the crew that afternoon. Uh, and that was a serious uh, flaw in the system. Communication problems. Lots of accidents and crashes, you know, are caused by multiple factors, including poor communications. Yeah, yeah. Normally it's, yeah, it's the, the trivial many, huh? <laughs> the trivial many. Now, um, getting back to getting back to the book, right? And and you are a good storyteller, okay? And and sometimes change, even in life, you know, if things are not going well, if you can align yourself with a story, so you know, you know, it's like once upon a time, and you want to get to happy ever after, but you've got lots of things that are going to disrupt it and be happy and pleasing, and some are going to be sad, etc. But as long as the story is making sense, it can keep you on track. So the fact that you're in probably one of the best storytelling capitals in the world and, and, and we, we come back to Gibneys again and, and a good point again is there's no better environment to be telling a story. But what do you think are the main takeaways from the, from the, the book Turbulence? I think the first one is how to manage through crisis. Yeah. You know, the, the first paragraph of the book talks about me being in a hospital, almost dying of uh, brain aneurysm and at the same time as that occurred i just come back from uh, dallas trying to get southwest to buy aloha and i landed and i was negotiating with the flight attendants while our pilots were negotiating uh with the united pilots in chicago and uh, we desperately needed united who was a co-chair partner to acquire us and they almost did i was negotiating with their ceo and then i had this brain aneurysm uh, going out to dinner it was like having somebody hit you with a baseball bat and the concierge in my condo probably saved my life because he called the ambulance right away. And yeah. they zipped me off. I was in intensive care for four days. But also, after I came out of intensive care, I was working with the pilots on the merger agreement. And you know, to this day, most of them don't know I was in the hospital. The CEO of United didn't know I was in the hospital. And I had a private room. And if you asked for me, I wasn't registered because I was a high profile guy negotiating all this uh, activity. Now, that was a, a pressure point and, and perhaps an example. I have so many examples of uh, managing crisis and pressure. And some of the common threads, which I, I, I talk about from a leadership point of view, yeah. is how you manage crisis and how you stay positive. I have yeah. said my entire life, I will not hang around negative people. Yeah. And wake Very up good. every day and you got a choice. You can be happy or sad. I mean, what's your choice? My wife marvels at the fact that when I get out of bed in the morning, I'm sharp within five seconds. And I said, well, I'm used to 24 seven and getting a phone call about a a crash or an emergency and you got to be sharp instantly and make tough decisions. It's just the way I was raised. So it's in my DNA. So you get sort of used to it, but the common sense angle, the calm under pressure. You remember uh, when, when you're under pressure, particularly in front of cameras, which I've had to do. Yeah. 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 People read you. We all read each other. 
I mean, yeah, we're, yeah. We're sort of an open book. Some of our body language, you, you can't hide. It is what it is. So you're sending signals to people in everything you say and do, particularly under crisis. You have to be calm. You have to have common sense. You don't want to blame people. You be, you know, a thought uh, provoking discussion. And uh, I, I learned that through, through lots of really hard times. I mean, I was in a bankruptcy uh, after I cut a deal with the uh, pension board in the U S to forgive a couple hundred million worth of our pension obligation, because nobody was going to buy an airline in bankruptcy yeah, with exactly. unfunded pension liability. And I was able to convince them uh, over, over a Christmas to do that. And then his, uh, Lawyers in Honolulu said they didn't have an agreement. The judge is waiting in chambers to close the deal. So I get a cell phone. I go into the men's room, which you're not allowed to do, in the courthouse, live and in person. And I call the managing director in D.C. And his secretary, Dawn, who I'll never forget, said, I'm not on the courthouse steps. I'm in the courthouse. And I have to have this document signed. And she said, well, it's done. He gets on the phone. I said, Dave, it's done. Well, you didn't help tell the third level down who's in the courtroom. I go into the courtroom, I get the guy, I bring him into the men's room, hand him the cell phone. You can't make this stuff up. And uh, he comes out and we come out of bankruptcy. He was not very happy with me. And I certainly don't get any Christmas cards from the guy, but another element of, of crisis. When in crisis, calm down, think through the possibilities. Also network in the right way. I'm giving away all my secrets here, Chris, but in, in a nice way, it's not always the vice president, the CEO, the board member, the chairman. It's the staff and the assistant and the secretary. And it's these folks that pull a lot of the levers and they get unappreciated. So one of the things that I think has been in my DNA, as I said, forever is appreciate people. It has nothing to do with your title. Yep, I mean, yep. when, I, when I moved to TWA in LA, I was running the ticket counter and the gates. I met all the Hollywood stars and it's kind of fun and easy stuff. And then he said, go down and run the ramp with all the union guys. I called my father, who was a pretty successful business guy in Philadelphia. And I said, Dad, what shall I do? I mean, union guys. And he, he said, son, manage people, whether they have white shirts, blue shirts, no shirts, it doesn't matter. It's all about leadership skills and people. And I went down and I set up my office right across the corridor from the time clock. Yeah. So these thousands of guys would come in and out and check in and out, pop in. I put a sofa down in the office. And they'd come in and they'd, they'd chat about what was really going on. That's why I flew in the cockpit, five or six different airlines, because you learn so much in the cockpit that you don't normally get in a boardroom. Yep, 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 yep. It's so, yeah, the old uh, helicopter view and 22,000 feet and everything. It's like the iceberg, you know. They, they know a little bit at the top, but it's the ones at the bottom who know exactly what's going on. And I think that's a shame, you know, that, that enough people don't, they don't actually spend time on the ground, you know, feet on the ground. And uh, they should do that every now and again. And, or not every now and again, they should do it on a regular basis. But not just for the sake of, of, you know, look, I'm here and aren't I doing a great job by coming down. But to actually show some interest and maybe even, you know, have a, you know, a predetermined checklist of things that they want to make sure is actually happening so that they're able to verify rather than somebody else validate. My first day on the job at Aloha in Honolulu. I went down to the back room, the outbound back room, my first day, yeah. Yeah. and chatted with the folks because I, I lived that life amongst others. And I always had this feeling, no matter what title you have or what level you're at, one of your thoughts might have as much value as the next person, regardless of title. And once you have that philosophy and you listen more than talk, yeah. you, you learn a lot. And then... How do you motivate people? You have to know what they're thinking. You can't just motivate them by giving a rah-rah speech. You have to understand what they're thinking. Early in my career, a TWA president came in and he was in town anyhow in LA. So I want to talk to a bunch of employees. You know, he never talked at with them. He talked at them. He, he didn't even look. He looked above them for like 15 minutes. I said, I was only a manager at the time. I said, you know, if I'm ever in a position of power like a CEO, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to talk with people. I'm not going yeah. to act people. Big difference. Yeah, no, huge difference, huge difference. Now, coming back to what you were saying about the calm zone and about, you know, fast brain, slow mouth. Why do you think, why do you think so many people, you also spoke about, you know, the, the, the media and the way people come at you now, you know, and it's, it's a very difficult thing. Why do you think so many senior managers have been caught out 
and, and have ended up, you know, losing a pretty good career because of that moment of madness or that moment of not being prepared enough, you know, for the, for the media when they come at you because they're all just looking for something negative, something to, you know, to jump on, to bite on. It's a terrible thing, but why do you think it is that they don't get enough media training? That's a good question, and they don't. When I was at uh, American, uh, Bob Crandall, insisted that every officer go through media training. Now, I had already been through, I, I, you know, in my early career, I did hundreds of interviews, TV, radio, press. I was very much used to it and, and how, you know, I was a valedictorian in college uh, and I learned senior year how to give speeches and how to get eye contact. So I had a lot more experience than your common everyday corporate officer or executive. But having said that, he did run people through training and I recall I was on a flight uh, early in my career, and a TV, famous TV guy, presenter out of LA, uh, was in the galley chatting with me, and he was a consultant part-time, teaching executives how to respond to the press. One of the things he said, which I never forgot, was, you don't have to answer their question. Yeah. Remember I said earlier, don't have to answer their yeah, question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Probably know more than them. And then, what do you want to spin? Politicians are genius at this. What do you want to say? Forget the question. Yeah, yeah. What what's your message? And exactly. then what's your message? And then exactly, who are you yeah. to? and all these different people that are going to watch you are going to draw conclusions. In today's environment, unfortunately, the media is like a gotcha kind of mentality. And forgetting politics for the moment, my brother's been a TV broadcaster in San Francisco for thirty years, and he's still on CBS radio every weekend. Talks to like seven million people or something, as he always reminds me. Uh, and I watched him once in the studio uh, in San Francisco, and it was a time of some financial crisis, and he was writing, get ready with the teleprompter, to put on a teleprompter to read it. And I said, why are you saying that about the economy and that it's going down? Because what you're telling everybody is going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy because yeah. of what you're saying. He said, you don't understand, it's, it's, uh, it's media week. It's, uh, th there's a word for it where the advertisers are judging how you're doing. And, uh, and it, relates to your advertising revenues per per spot yep yep you get and, the numbers uh, up they'll, they'll they'll support you and then he i said yeah but you write it this way and you're not a trained economist and ma and pa fricket in detroit aren't going to buy that car refrigerator for another year because of your comments so you're actually causing the problem in part because your media presence gives people some sort of legitimacy of what you say which is not necessarily true. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent, and that—that's why you know some of the some of the people that they allow on on some of the government representative positions, you know, they look like rabbits that are caught in the in the spot, and and you can tell that they've been asked a question that they don't believe in, but because they got a toe to line, they got to try and legitimise that particular question and the answer. It's such yeah. a shame. Yeah, they're like deer deer in the headlights. We yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Now, now, obviously. Uh, you know, it's great, and, and, and my God, you've got some huge experience. Now, the managers of today, under this unprecedented um, issue that's affecting everybody, no matter where we are, no matter what colour we are, religion, irrespective, everybody is affected by this, and it's, it's incredible. However, there's, and you said it earlier, there's a way of looking at it either as a, an, in a negative way, which is what you're seeing all the time in press and people are watching too much news and they're watching too much bad news. And then there's a way of looking at it in a more positive way. Now, I also believe that there's going to be a little bit more turmoil with regards to the two tug of war teams, the younger generation and the older generation, because that's where, that's where this dilemma is, is, is having a little bit of a, a get together. Now, Moving forward and focusing on positives, what do you think are the main things that people should be focusing on in senior positions in airlines? Because something that you said earlier, there's going to be this rapid reboot or a restart because people need to generate some cash because you cannot, no matter what anybody says, stay in lockdown forever because it will just cripple everything else. So it's almost like get out there quick, get as much money as you can. When the second wave comes, hopefully we've learned enough from the first waves that came, which we were a little bit paralyzed instead of being active and, and getting ready to chase it. But when the second wave comes, we've got to be more structured, more consistent. We've got to collaborate more and be more open and transparent. 
So what sort of advice with that sort of crisis environment would you give to, to the leaders of, of today who are looking um, to tomorrow? Well, I think, uh, and I'll give you some specific examples, but communication. Yeah. Constant communication to employees and customers, government officials, and so on, because everybody's in the game, whether it's the TSA, airport authorities, employees, uh, unions, lessors. People don't yeah. talk about lessors who are really in serious trouble. I mean, there's yeah. all kinds of different groups. Uh, you know, there's 750,000 employees in the in the u.s airline industry but they have there's about 10 million people that are affected by it affected, yeah, yeah. so so imagine this chris when you walk into an airport you're already not me because i love it but you get worried there's something that happens to the human body when they walk into that terminal because they're just not used to flying at thirty thousand feet on a tube and all that so you imagine a guy that uh has his family with him he's going to disneyland and he's yep. at the gate and there's a delay of multiple hours, call it a creeping delay. And uh, he yells and screams at the gate agent. The gate agent is the one person that did not cause the delay. That I can guarantee. Yeah. Second, he's the only guy that's going to help you right now. So why yeah. are you screaming at this guy? So part of it's going to be training of employees, kind of like I'm okay, you're okay, transactional analysis training to diffuse situations. I think that's important. Communication yeah. to customers is important. What's going to happen when you walk through and into that terminal is going to be different than before. You may not have friends and family uh, past the door. Uh, when you check in, a lot of it's going to be automated, obviously, and no, no touch. Some element with, with TSA and uh, pre-checks and temperature checks and, and maybe passport, va vaccine passports, something's all going to happen. Uh, and that's going to be different. So we, being the industry, needs to be have a consistent protocol yeah. like in security because security started i i was in security in the 70s when airplanes were being hijacked to cuba my airplanes i mean my first week on the job somebody took one so and it's gotten better over the years after 9 11 even better but you'll notice that security everywhere in the world is pretty much the same protocol we have to get there on passenger processing we're nowhere near there yeah yeah i don't know if yeah. you're aware of this but when you check in for a flight there's a passenger manifest that goes to the destination in the U.S. They already know who's on that airplane. They've already checked everybody out to see who's a potential problem before, yeah. they, before they even take off. You can do that with temperature checks and, and blood checks so that if the guy is on the airplane and, and is infected and you didn't catch him before, on arrival, you're going to weed him out and say, sorry, you're 14-day quarantine because you have the, – the, the, these kinds of things need to be worked on. I'm a firm believer that the FAA has to be involved. They have to mandate masks. Yeah. They haven't. They've stopped short of that. Say, well, we're not involved in the health business. Well, you were when you stopped smoking on airplanes. Yeah. You we're in every other regulation in terms of duty rigs and so on. Why wouldn't this be the case? Yeah. We, otherwise, Chris, I can guarantee you're going to fist fights on airplanes. Some guys exactly, gonna David. Yep. Yeah. And it's he's not, say, not I'm a lawyer. Yeah. This is against my rights, and I'm not going to do it. And the guy next to him, his family, says, "Wait a minute, it's going to happen." And it's going yeah, to be yeah. filmed, and it's going to be on the evening news. It's, it's, but if you have the protocols in place and yeah, government yeah. behind you, you can mitigate that. So there needs to be lots of cooperation instead of name calling and, and politics. And, you know, part of this thing with the open bridges that launched again this, this week, and one day you're going to be able to fly to Greece, the next day you aren't, or the U.S. or not. And how do you schedule that as an airline? I have no idea. But we need to kind of be more together and, and not as much political and soundbite and more logical in our decision making yeah. and the people that really know what they're talking about make yeah. those decisions. Yep, yeah. stories that make sense to help people understand why. And e even those corridors, David, if, if they have triggers that if a country or a, a, a certain region in that country starts to hit the R level or starts to get too many cases, well, they know that then if it's going to hit another um, um, should we say another level above that then there would be a withdrawal so then people can get a little bit more used to ramping up contracting ramping up contracting because at the end of the day you want to protect as many people as possible but there needs to be a lot more intelligence used and and risk-based evaluation rather than just across the board which is what's happening now i agree i think that's why they put in uh green red and amber in the middle i think the amber in the middle is the one that's in the bubble. <laughs> yeah Right, listen, it's amazing now. Um, we're coming to the end of this podcast and you, my friend, I would love to 
meet for a pint at about 12.30 in Gibneys. <laughs> And then about eight or nine o'clock in the evening, we'd leave there and just go across the road there for something to eat and then back again to Gibneys and finish off. Um, Sounds like a, a very, plan. Yep, you're a very interesting man. So before we finish, what three, what three reasons would you give to anybody listening as to why they should read Turbulence? Uh, real life stories that teach leadership skills that go beyond the airline industry. And yeah. it's supported, the philosophies are supported by real life situations. So I, I think that's the first one. The second one is to gain a greater appreciation for what the industry really is about, what the yeah. decision makers are all about, why certain airlines failed, why others succeeded, which are good lessons in life. Plus for the traveler, it gives an insight that the traveling public doesn't see. And I would hope that the third is to be more humanistic when you're interfacing with airline employees that flight attendant and that gate agent are at the point of the spear. They yeah. really are, and they deserve respect and attention. After 9-11, and I met the first flight back in Minneapolis, and I walked onto that flight, and the crew were crying, and the captain never flew again. I put in counseling. It, it didn't work. The tensions were high, but the passengers were docile, respectful of the crew members, and that lasted for a fairly long time, and then it sort of eroded over time. So I think the third one is, understand what the folks that service you are all about, why they care about your health, welfare, and, and safety, and give them respect because guess what? You're going to get it back in return. Yeah, that care is an important word there, David. And um, listen, just before we finish, another little coincidence. 37 years ago on my honeymoon, I flew on Pan Am to Honolulu. Ah. So we've got a lot of... <laughs> Little did I know then that I'd be talking to a man 37 years later who'd be covering Hawaii, who'd be covering Pan Am and so many other subjects. Lived in, I lived in, uh, in Honolulu and went to Waikiki Beach every day for four years. And my skin cancer specialist has advised me not to do it again. Oh, really? Yeah. But, well, I was going to say, well, but you've lived through a lot now. So right. you're, uh, you're in a good place. But listen, you're a very interesting man. I, like I said to you earlier, I'm, I've definitely ordered uh, my copy of Turbulence. When I've had a little read through it, please, God, we'll be in a place where I can, I can have another chat with you, whether it's on a podcast or, or privately. But I'd love to keep in touch with you. And I am so jealous that you'll be able to go and have a pint of Guinness in Gibneys today, tomorrow, and whenever. So listen, thank you so, so much for giving up your valuable time. Please apologize to your, your dear wife for that. Uh, reference to a chapter in my book which um, I hope she wasn't too upset about. He's been exposed to worse hanging around me. Is that right? That's good. That's always good to know. But listen, you're a lovely man to talk to. Thank you so, so much for your valuable time. Well, thank you for your courtesies and, and actually your insight in the industry is very keen. I could tell from our interface that you have more than common knowledge about what it's all about. So I appreciate your insightfulness and your, your questions and, and your courtesy. Thanks, Chris. I mean, I'll, I'll record that and I'll play that back to a few people in the future, I think. All the best. God bless. Stay, stay well. Stay safe. Cheers. Thank you.